Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome back to the conference. Um, thank you for joining this session this afternoon on how cities can be harmonized to cope with climate challenges while ensuring that nobody is left behind. I think that in itself uh, is a, a big, big challenge, especially um, in the context of the uh, COVID pandemic and also the fact that climate impacts are accelerating perhaps faster um, than scientists had expected and cities are on the front line of both of those things. Um, before we start, I will introduce myself. My name is Megan Rowling. I'm a journalist with the Thomson Reuters Foundation, which is the charitable part of Reuters News. And we cover a range of topics um, around human rights, um, humanitarian, sustainable development issues. And those include uh, climate change and cities. So for many years now, we've been looking at um, how cities can become more resilient. Um, as their populations grow, as they um, become more threatened by extreme weather, things like heat waves, flooding, um, coastal pressures for those cities um, that are dealing with sea level rise. Um, and at the same time, they face the need to um, become more energy efficient and to use less fossil fuels and to participate in the green transition because they uh, are responsible for 75 to 80% of global carbon emissions. Um, and I think, you know, now cities are facing these pressures at the same time that they actually have been hit very, very hard by the COVID pandemic. Um, and in response, we've seen cities um, saying that they want to make uh, their streets easier for people to walk on, cycle on, and have perhaps uh, taken some of the easier um, policy options that they have been able to uh, so far, things like putting in more bike lanes and um, calming traffic as they've taken advantage of there being less traffic during the pandemic. But I think one of the um, key issues now is that we don't know how uh, the COVID-19 pandemic will impact on cities longer term. Um, you know, the predictions are for cities to get bigger and bigger in terms of having more and more people, um, but will the pandemic make them less attractive places for people to live and work in? Um, how do we balance the impacts of the pandemic on key participatory processes for planning, uh, for some of the key facilities in cities that are used for resilience, like community centres and those kinds of things. And what does the COVID pandemic mean for cities reaching sustainable development goals? Um, and in fact, leaving nobody behind, which is a key part of the sustainable development goals, because one of the things that the pandemic has exposed, I think, is the fault lines within cities. Um, some of the inequalities um, between uh, different um, prosperity levels in cities and some of the particular difficulties facing essential workers. I think if we end up getting a green recovery, which is far from clear at this point globally, um, with a lot of job creation in renewable energy and those kind of sectors, um, and the skills training is provided for people to participate, to make the transition then, uh, the topic that we're discussing today um, may be one that becomes easier to achieve. If not, I'm afraid cities might struggle and it, and, and it could become much harder to cope with climate challenges while ensuring that nobody's left behind. So I think at the moment this is a wide open topic, so I'm very much um, looking forward to hearing from our speakers today who will showcase different examples of what's been done up to now in terms of collaborating across different departments, networks, cities, and groups of citizens to better deal with the adversities of climate change. Um, and we'll be looking at the experience of different cities. So we have a good range of presentations um, touching on different subjects and um, different places and that will hopefully set an example for other cities um, to draw on and, and replicate some of the work that we're going to hear about today. So we're going to start with a presentation um, from, our, uh, from the host city, which is Barcelona, where I'm also based. And just to say that we're going to have six presentations of about 10 minutes each, and then we will go to a question and answer session. Um, so please do submit your questions and we will do our best to answer those after the presentations. So we will start first with um, Andoni Gonzalez, who is um, 
belongs to the technical staff in the urban resilience department under the infrastructure and urban coordination management of the Barcelona City Council. And Andoni is going to talk to us today about science-based solutions for the effective implementation of climate actions in this city of Barcelona. Thanks, Andoni. Thank you, Megan. Um, hi, all, and thank you all for attending the meeting. I'm going to share my screen in order to you can see the presentation. Okay, so um, we're going to explain how science can help our cities to improve our. Can you see? Yeah. So I was saying, we're going to explain how science uh, can help our cities to improve its climate action, taking into account the vulnerable population. As you may know, um, Barcelona uh, has a plan and it is called the Climate Plan. The Climate Plan was developed uh, during the 2018 and it's an holistic plan that takes into account uh, four goals. It goes for mitigation because we cannot allow a context of economic recovery to follow up into consuming in an unsustainable way again. Another goal is adaptation and resilience because we can already see the effects of climate change and we have to prepare ourselves. Climate justice, it's another goal of the climate plan because we need to put the most vulnerable people at the center of the climate policies. And we want also to promote action by the general public with co-creation projects. <clears throat> Climate plan, it's a comprehensive plan because it, it integrates several previous sectorial strategic plans related with climate, but it also focuses on those actions that need to be seriously accelerated and on innovative measures to achieve new goals. Climate plan is an ambitious plan. It's aligned with the Paris goals of carbon neutrality by 2050 acquiring a 45% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and turn us as our city, Barcelona, into a carbon neutral city by 2050. If we talk about mitigation, but if we talk about adaptation, we pretend to increase our green urban green spaces by 1.6 square kilometers by 2030. And also, we want to achieve a domestic potable water consumption less than 100 liters um, per inhabitant and per day. Regarding climate justice, we want to have a zero energy poverty and obtain 100% of clean um, funding. Um, well, um, the climate plan is in an innovative plan that takes into advantage of the latest technologies and research studies. We say it is a science-based plan, and what is what I'm going to explain further in, in this presentation. And we focus on vulnerable people, and we put it at the center of climate um, policies. <clears throat> and finally, the, uh, we want to just to remark uh, that in this sense, the climate plan has been awarded as the best initiative of the major European cities for the covenant of mayors for climate and energy. Well, why the climate plan is a science-based uh, plan? Um, we made the climate projections uh, where by the Catalan, Catalan Meteorologic Service, who developed a downscaling methodology for the Catalan region and the metropolitan area of Barcelona, taking into account three global climatic models extracted from the IPCC Fifth Climatic Report. And uh, there were simulated the, the, representative, the representative concentration pathways 4.5 and 8.5 for three different uh, periods. Uh, the results were that uh, we will have an increase in temperatures and we expect less rainfall for the uh, next uh, century. But uh, thanks to Rescue Project, uh, these uh, climate projections have been updated and thanks to the FIC, the Fundación para la Investigación del Clima from Madrid, that uh, made uh, all the scientific and the uh, statistical studies. And they take into account 10 global models, which improve uh, our three uh, models I, I said before. 
and um, we have now uh, climate projections uh, and vegetal predictions until 2035. Well, um, this, uh, the studies confirmed that the trend about the increasing temperature and also that we are going to expect more concentrated rainfall in um, more uh, and higher intensity uh, events. Well, now, um, in the light of these important changes, the City Council developed a series of vulnerability assessments for the different hazards of future climate change. Now, I'm going to focus on heat, and it's one of the, and it's the, the hard uh, climate impact that the Barcelona City is going to face in the, in the next years. Well, uh, as you can see in the graph on, um, on the right, the mean temperature in, in, temp in Barcelona has, uh, has increased one degree in the last 28 years. Um, and if we take a look to the future projections, we can see that nowadays we are reaching the expected values for the committed scenario by the end of the century. This data can give us an idea of the real risk that we are going to face in the next years. And well, how, how we do what, what we do with this, this information? Well, we developed the heat vulnerability index to get an idea of how exposed was the city to heat. First, we created a vulnerability map to high temperature, taking into account the next parameters population older than 75 years, high cooling demand buildings, presence or absence of, of green areas, and the socioeconomic level. Then we crossed this vulnerability with the exposition map to heat, taking as a basis the heat wave of 2015. This resulted in a heat risk map of the city. That is the map that you can see at the top uh, bottom right of the, of the screen. <clears throat> and how do we use this information? So we use it to set quantitative goals. For example, the ones related to um, climate justice. The climate justice goals put vulnerable people at the center of the climate policies and are oriented to the eradication of energy poverty in the city within a large amount of adaptation goals. We can also find another one like um, the climate shelter tries to um, to give to the hundred percent of the population at five minutes food from a climate shelter. And we focus on vulnerable people because in Barcelona we have more than 10% population that lives in energy poverty conditions. That means that they are not able to meet energy and water services for the basic needs of its member, that is maintaining the house in, <coughs> sorry, maintaining housing in an air conditioning conditions suitable for health that means 18 to 20 degrees in winter and 25 degrees in summer and they don't have the minimum drinking water what is uh, set in uh, 100 liters per day uh, on a person and also we studied how uh, socioeconomic inequalities uh, had a direct relationship with health as you can see that graph, you can see the different districts of, of Barcelona and the life expectancy of their inhabitants, where we can see that depending on the neighborhood you live, you can reach, you can have at least 4.5 years more than others of your inhabitants of the city. And this also affects um, to gender. Gender inequalities have also at its incident regarding high temperatures. As we can see, women are significantly more affected than men. We have, we have more than 3,000 deaths caused by extreme heat in the last 23 years, which 70% of that were women. And how we use this information so we establish uh, actions one of them one of the most important actions that we are uh, taking now is the climate shelter network 
it's uh, the adaptation goal that we want to reach is that 100, the total population of the city at less than five minutes foot from a climate shelter. We understand that the climate shelter are spaces that provide climate comfort to the population during climate emergencies to extreme heat. Uh, vulnerable people are in the center of this of this action. We understand that uh, there are newborns, people over 75 years old, uh, chronically Ill, Ill and economically disadvantaged people. These climate shelters can be indoor, they not be they cannot be necessary air conditioner, or it can be exterior like parks, uh, gardens with uh, green areas, or so water points, water parks. And normally, or usually, they have another uh, functionalities. Well, here you can see how we can, we set this this climate shelter facilities into using these uh, tools, <clears throat> and they integrate. Therefore. No, sorry, those that are crossed with the vulnerable population maps and we obtain the coverage degree and the journey times climate shelters for vulnerable people. This maps allows to identify gaps and bad coverage areas of the city that will need to pay special attention in the future planning of the city. Well, this was uh, what we are tackling heat and I can say now what we, how the city of Barcelona is taking water scarcity and floodings. And regarding water scarcity, um, the Barcelona Ciclo del Agua, the CASA, is the company in charge of the water, the water planning. And um, we have um, published the Alternative Water Resources Plan and that calculates the demand and availability of the groundwater, rainwater, and regenerated uh, water. And also, we have published the draft protocol uh, with a set uh, which sets a list of action aimed to save water and define the restrictions of use during a several drought event like um, like uh, stop uh, urban cleaning or or the uses and finally and just recently published i don't know what's happening Do we need do we need your next slide, Anthony? Yeah, I can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, um I I don't know what's happening, but I cannot uh I cannot put the last uh, the last slide. Okay, perhaps well, if you could just summarize it then. Yes, because, yes um, to say because uh, there is another uh, presentation tomorrow. It was about the master drainage plan of the city, which has been presented uh, recently by the Bar Barcelona Water Cycle Company. And I aim you all to to take a look of um, at it tomorrow. I think that Alejandro Tit is, is uh, presenting it. And well, this is I, I've tried to explain how Barcelona is is trying to tackle uh, heat and, and fluid impacts and how science can be used to to improve our our work. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Andoni. That was really interesting to hear, especially uh, about the plan for dealing with extreme heat. I think anyone who spent time in Barcelona in the summer knows it can be uh, not the most comfortable experience. And in fact, um, a lot of those who do have the means to escape from the city to the mountains or the coast actually do so. 
Um, but I think a lot of the vulnerable populations that you you were talking about, uh, perhaps the people who are less able to leave um, for more comfortable <laughs> parts of Catalonia or where else, wherever else uh, pe people go to. Um, so those heat um, relief, uh, that heat relief is is no doubt um, going to be extremely appreciated and necessary. So we'll move on to our next presentation, um, which is by uh, Nieves Mestre. Um, she is based in uh, Madrid, a uh, professor at the UPM School of Architecture uh, in Madrid. And her research focuses on the requirements of um, ecology for architectural design. She also works as an expert with the EU Research Executive Agency and is the founder of the architecture platform Combo Lab. Uh, Nervis is going to talk to us today um, about an initiative called Madrid Platform Cities, um, which is a joint effort by the Technical University of Madrid and the Madrid City Council. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Megan, for this presentation. Um, I will launch my screen as well. Yes, um, um, as uh, Megan has pointed, Madrid Platform Cities is an initiative by uh, the IED, the um, Center for Technical Innovation and Medicine, and multi-task collaboration on organizations addressing climate change adaptation and providing based prototypes. The same in days of dealing uh, uh, with the issue of uh, high end uh, effect in the last years. The particular presentation will tackle issues of how to address interdisciplinarity, which is in some occasions taking part in this kind of invitation of a network of students beyond the near disciplines. Um, so first of all, I want to find this uh, graph stated by Lee and in 2018. Uh, in disciplinarity is presented um, as something that occurs spontaneously when various experts are looking at the question and receive from different uh, fields. In this scenario, most um, years will transfer of knowledge across the business, as it is the case of these two circles below. Uh, as it is the case, for instance, of the social psychology or bioengineering, this hybrid uh, intelligence, while transdisciplinary uh, transdisciplinarity, which uh, occurs really integrates the natural, social, and health sciences in a novel and transformative context. Um, sustainable development goals um, and sustainability in general uh, is requiring um, uh, the transdisciplinary approach. And that is what the IDM is making this conversation, this collaboration that uh, has with the city. I'm first um, sending a little bit the basis for this interdisciplinarity or hopefully. Transcending into the transdisciplinarity, uh, need to create new spaces for innovation and engagement. Um, as you can see here, we are mapping relevant actors, silos, synergies, not only inside the council uh, but also outside. And we are um, also um, addressing external funding and networking uh, opportunities especially at uh, European research projects, which are facilitating a lot um, this implementation um, uh, process. And lastly, but not less, um, the incorporation of local and unconventional knowledge for relevant fields, uh, as it is uh, the world of art and design in full um, network. In all, it results as follows. Uh, the union in one side is providing this connecting tissue, provoking, assessing, and sustaining collaboration. This is the council, which is the balance owner, the pilots, generating the public policies. And all of this, as uh, I explained later, as the case our center, are amplifying links and communication with citizens and promoting cooperation in different ways. 
Yes, I'm very, very sorry um, to interrupt, but we're having a lot of difficulty hearing you. It's breaking up um, and um, we're only getting small snatches of what you're saying. I apologize for this. So if you don't mind, I think we're going to go to the next presentation and we will return to you. And I apologize for that. We, we thought it was improving and then it deteriorated again, but it would be such a shame if we don't get to hear properly uh, what you have to say. So. Um, Yes, apologies to everybody. We were hoping the connection would improve, but we're going to move on now. We'll come back to you, um, Nieves. I'm sorry about that. So our next speaker now um, is Gonzalo Cradilla. Um, he's an interdisciplinary researcher um, in Germany at the TU Darmstadt, and he's working at the intersection between nature-based solutions and urban planning and policy. His current research focuses on how the restoration of urban rivers contributes to more resilient, just, healthy and sustainable cities. So I think you're going to focus particularly on Dominican Republic um, and the hydromorph oh, I'm not sure I can pronounce that word, hydromorphological and sociocultural assessment of urban river rivers in promoting nature-based solutions there. Thanks, Gonzalo. Thank you very much, Megan. So I'm about to share my screen now. Yeah, can you see the presentation now? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much for having me. Mm, I will go straight to the um, content of the presentation. Okay, so just for you to give you an idea and some context, uh, we are talking about the Dominican Republic. This is an island in the Caribbean. Here we have Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and here you see the Jaque del Norte River Basin. This is the largest basin in the country. And here is our um, a case study uh, site. This is the city of Jarabacoa. It's located in the mountains of uh, the Dominican Republic. And the issue there is that we have a very contrasting situation. So what you see here is just a few kilometers away from the city. This uh, image on the bottom, it's uh, even uh, in the peri-urban um, area of the city. So you see people enjoying the river, having a, a nice experience at the water and at the same time within the city we have major challenges so this is one creek within the city of Arabacoa here we have some flooding events uh, in the city last year and here you see some of the largest green spaces that the that the city has public spaces these are this is the main square and this is just one pocket park in Arabacoa lacks very much of public space, green spaces. So in the 60s, since the 60s, there, has, there have been plans to recover the, the Jaque del Norte River. But uh, unfortunately, not like in, in Europe, in Latin America, just uh, these restoration uh, projects have started in the last 10 years. We lack of uh, funding. We lack of uh, political will in many in many countries. This is the case of the Dominican Republic. So, Plan Yaque, which is um, an NGO, uh, which is trying to turn into a river basin organization, they wanted or they want. They are working on a restoration plan for the Yaque River in Jarabacoa. And the question was where to start, given the fact that there's no funding for studies and there is very limited staff. So, what can they do and what they, did we do to help them uh, propose a plan just for for starters um, about uh, restoration in Harabacoa. So what we did was we combined a hydromorphological assessment. Um, we included some urban quality parameters and we made a citizen survey to to capture some of the perceptions and uses of the citizens uh, in Harabacoa, the, the uses of the river in Harab the rivers in Harabacoa. And based on this, we defined some priority areas for nature-based solution implementation. Um, 
so here you see the urban area of Arabacoa. This is the Jaque del Norte River and two creeks that flow through the city. These three uh, water courses, these are the ones that, uh, that have been focused by, by Plan Yaque for the first implementation phases. So this is the, the hydromorphological assessment that we did. This is based on the lava protocol, which is uh, used in Germany. Uh, this was designed in the framework of the, of the water framework directive. So what you see here, the river is divided into, into three sections, the riverbed, the riverbank, and the floodplain corridor. And we use segments, 500 meters or 200 meters, depending on the, on the width of the, um, of the river, we divide the river in, into segment, in segments. And for each segment, we assess 28 parameters. So for example, one of these parameters would be curvature. Uh, we expect in this region uh, to have a relatively good curvature, but if the, the river has been changed uh, by infrastructure interventions, then we would see in some places straight rivers. This is, so this is the scoring system. The closer to the natural state, the higher the, the score. Another example would be the river profile, as you can see here. So we repeat this, this process for each one of these river sections. This give us, gives us um, a score. And for each segment, we get some points that I, I will show later what we do with them. So here you can see the result of this. Um, a scoring system brings us to, you see here again, the floodplain corridor, the river bank, the river bed, and again, on the other side, the same. We have five classes. This, the colors tell us how good or degraded is the, the river state in, in relation to the natural state. Then we did the same, but with some social cultural uh, parameters. In this case, we used five um, visibility, which is how, how well can the citizens see the river if it's not, uh, for example, underground, reachability, accessibility, peculiarity, and amenity. So we did this also, this is a visual assessment. We walk along the, along the river and we score these parameters. Again, we obtain a similar scoring system um, that we can show on a map to identify which areas are hampered or which areas are, have good uh, urban quality or social cultural uh, quality. And finally, we did a citizen survey. So we uh, applied a semi-stratified sampling to ask people what uh, are their perceptions on rivers and green blue spaces in the, in the city. So what we have here is uh, the combined result of this assessment. What you can see here, for example, for the Yaque del Norte River, you see that we have some good potential areas. We have good hyd hydromorphological conditions here and also socio-cultural socio uh, conditions here. On the other hand, we can see that we have deficits, some areas with deficits, bad conditions. We see here, bad, again, bad hydro hydromorphological conditions and the bad socio-cultural uh, socio conditions. So, and, and then with the survey, we know that people prefer to go to certain areas in the city. So we know for sure because People uh, refer to these places very often here on the north side and here on the southern side, the places that I showed before. We know that people go there because there's good accessibility or because uh, there's um, nice conditions for um, taking swimming and so on. So with all this information, we proposed some measures for the, for the city. This allowed us to identify places that are good because they have uh, high ecological quality. So you can see here at the confluence of the, this is an, this, we're talking about this area. So here you can see that we proposed um, the, the implementation of a reverse, uh, river buffer here, protection areas, because this is high slope um, yeah, zones that are prone to land, landslides. Also here, we propose the implementation of a riverside park um, and some bicycle lanes connecting these areas with the city. 
Another example of this, we are talking about now uh, of one of the creeks. This, as you can see, this creek is flowing through the city. Uh, this picture here, you are seeing a backyard of a private uh, plot. So what we proposed as basically 80% of the river now flows through private plots. What we proposed is to implement a, a community-based restoration uh, plan to do some revegetation of these backyards and some protection of the of the river be, uh, bed and the river bank. Um, also, what you can see, what you see here, this is uh, some work done by Plan Yake, this uh, NGO that is working locally at Harabacoa. They have implemented these um, artificial wetlands to uh, implement uh, a gray water um, wastewater a treatment. This is done together with the with the communities, local neighbor communities. Mm, and uh, as a conclusion, what we what we would like to highlight is that um, given the fact that in many Latin American cities we lack of funding, we lack of uh, the expertise, uh, we found that this um, method is uh, highly applicable. Um, it's low cost and it can provide good, uh, reliable and um, yeah, uh, cost efficient uh, information for local communities, NGOs and even local governments to uh, start designing the plans for towards more, more resilient cities. So thank you very much. And that would be my presentation. Thanks so much. I'll just start my video. Thanks so much, Gonzalo. Um, that was um, really fascinating and you could see um, the concrete results um, of, of your work in, in those photos, um, which I uh, expect was uh, highly appreciated um, by the people living in those areas. Um, we're going to go now to Alex Ryan um, with the Resilient Cities Network. Um, Alex is a manager in the programs and innovation team, um, and he works on the R Cities Project Pipeline, which is a database of initiatives um, from the network cities aimed at identifying project demands at a, a global scale according to themes. Um, and he also manages the development and delivery of resilience recovery tools um, for a program called C2R. Alex, I like the title of your uh, presentation, which is Climate and Urban Resilience. You can't have one without the other. So do elaborate on that and, uh, and uh, explain why. Thank you. Uh, well, I think I was listening to the Rat Pack and it's of course a bit of a play on words of their famous song. Um, and I just thought it's also very true. Uh, let me share my screen quickly and I will get going. I hope that you can see, oh no, hold on. Is that um, working yet? Um, that looks like it is. Wonderful stuff. So um, yeah, I think it's also very true. We'll go into some details as to why in a minute and some specific examples but I think if you're looking at urban resilience or well, climate change specifically you cannot address it without thinking holistically about the city systems that operate and uh, function within cities. Um, so I'll start with just a little bit about what we do and what we have done. Um, with the Resilient Cities Network we are essentially a continuation of the 100 Resilient Cities program which uh, many of you may have associated with or, or heard of um, which we transitioned over the last year and as of last month we're now the Resilient Cities Network. Um, we worked with cities by offering chief resilience officers like Ares Gabas in, in, in Barcelona. Um, every, every city developed a resilience strategy and we essentially used a group of platform partners to support from a technical perspective. Um, and fundamentally that culminated in a global network, which we now continue to manage <clears throat> uh, of cities, practitioners, experts. Um, and that is essentially what a uh, global or what Resilient Cities Network does today. It's um, a vast network spanning the globe, as you'll see here, uh, with 84 chief resilience officers across 97 cities these days, uh, speaking 21 languages, 47 countries, and the cities face a variety of challenges due to culture, size, everything. Uh, 
Uh, they range in size from 40,000, I think our smallest may be Vila in Denmark, to 21 million, which Mexico City, uh, Jakarta, any of those global mega cities that we work with. Um, and essentially now the purpose is instead of us pushing out these resilient strategies, we want to listen to the cities uh, because after five years, they know a hell of a lot more than we do about what they want and need to do. Uh, and they're now essentially resilience experts. So it's a city led impact focused and regionally driven organization based on partnerships for sustainability. Uh, now into the meat of the presentation, um, climate and resilience and why you really cannot have one without the other. Um, so the project pipeline was mentioned at the, at the very beginning by Megan. Um, essentially what it is, is it's a, uh, we, we spoke to our member cities to gather their top three to five per city priority projects that they are looking to implement. Um, and from across all the regions, we had to essentially look at uh, what the methodologies for data collection were, were distinct per region, just simply because of whatever reason it may be technological or cultural differences that led to us uh, developing these new methodologies. But we essentially um, gathered data across all five regions. Um, and we gathered, I think, 320 initiatives in total, um, 43 of which directly related to climate adaptation or climate mitigation, which uh, as, a, as a combination was the third most popular uh, behind, uh, for example, the top one was municipal capacity. Um, so the point of this slide here is to demonstrate that cities are looking, of course, at climate adaptation and mitigation. But if you dive deep into what those projects really look at, of course, they're trying to solve the climate crisis and they will work towards that. But as well as that, we've got 20 different project themes that we classify the, the projects against relating to data for example how can cities better use data to understand their climate issues energy of course a very obvious one what techniques can cities implement in order to create clean clean energy um housing and settlements but that example may relate to building efficiency uh, resilience finance and insurance what can financial institutions the city um financial departments or uh, economics departments of cities and insurance companies in the private sector do to ensure that the projects they're funding are more resilient uh, and of course help to combat climate change. So again, the purpose of this slide is to demonstrate that what we found from our cities is that yes, of course, a lot of the projects and initiatives that they're prioritizing directly relate to climate adaptation and climate mitigation. But without thinking about that from that resilience perspective with that, that resilience lens and the other city systems that they will each contribute towards positively or negatively, you will never fully appreciate the full picture of these of these projects and what their reach and impact is. Um, I will now go into four case studies um, from some of these are just some of these from the project pipeline. Some of these are from the resilient strategies that 100 resilient cities developed. Um, the first one is from Quito in Ecuador. Um, it's a high altitude city. Uh, it has a lot of it's quite mountainous. Um, the urban periphery is, is quite fertile um, and essentially it has its climate problems, flooding, extreme heat, so on and so forth. So the city decided to implement a set or, or create a, I can't remember the exact number, 20, 30 urban farms around the periphery because, as I said, the land's very fertile. It's ripe for growing crops, no pun intended. Um, so what this did of course is create these farms which created jobs it also created healthier communities because they're growing their own vegetables uh, it had impacts in terms of delivery miles so it was sort of um, the climate footprint of, of each vegetable instead of being imported or even driven 200 miles from the countryside they were local uh, but it also stopped flooding so this land would have just been uh, it would just created surface runoff when there was heavy rain which as you can see would have just flown straight down into the city behind it the crops and the trees and the new plants, at least to a certain degree, absorb water, which stops flooding. It also creates cooling spaces for when during times of extreme heat. Um, and it's created jobs for the communities. This, uh, we're moving to Paris in France now. So the I think this was arguably 100 RC's um, most talked about project. Um, 
the schoolyard Cooling Island Oases in, in Paris. So again, like every single city in the world, um, Paris faces climate issues, specifically in this case, the urban heat island effect is an increasingly uh, severe problem in the city. Um, the city of Paris, the government wanted to address uh, its um, wanted to address this and it was uh, one way to do this was to essentially create cooling oases so cool spaces cool places around the city that people can visit it needed to do this on land it owned uh, it owns the essentially the whole edu well the, the state education system in france uh, i think the stat is in 20 arrondissements in central paris nobody lives more than 200 meters or something like that from from a from a school so these are great places a they own them b they're close to where people live um, so they decided to create these cooling oases in the playgrounds as a way to cool down the neighborhood, cool down the immediate area, um, but also as a, as a pilot project for further expansion into other areas later. Um, now, of course, the benefits are that the kids, when they're at school, aren't working in extraordinarily hot conditions and they've got somewhere safe to play. Um, the way that the city approaches from a resilience angle was, well, we may as well get these kids to to if they're going to be using these playgrounds, they may as well be using something that they like and they enjoy. So the kids were involved in designing these playgrounds and the city of Paris with the, the, the architectural team and the schools team collaborated and the environmental team, they, the, the three collaborated with the resilience team to involve these kids to design playgrounds that they uh, wanted to use. So as well as creating these um, cooling spaces where temperatures are lower, uh, they're safer for the children, better, more productive learning environments. They're also places that they want to be because they've had an input into the, um, into the design. Now, of course, that doesn't mean they did the structural, but they certainly, the conceptual aspects of the design, they were heavily involved with. There is also uh, the plan to, if protocol will allow, uh, let vulnerable residents such as the elderly visit the schoolyards at weekends during times of extreme heat, but I don't believe that's been incorporated yet. Uh, the next one is in Accra in Ghana. Um, so, I mean, again, climate is the, the key topic here. Concrete everywhere. Concrete is king in many cities around the world. Um, and that essentially just exacerbates the urban heat island effect. Um, so this, the city wanted to design certain spaces and squares that would create these cooling spaces again, but also create um, pride in local residents. So it was almost like um, essentially somewhere that residents would be proud of within their local neighborhoods. So they got residents in to talk about local culture, talk about what made their neighborhoods unique, and as well as just creating the green spaces here that you see and expanding upon those um, and creating these cooling spaces, they made places that people wanted to be that people could be and people could be proud of, which essentially instilled this um, feeling of pride within residents, um, which again, makes them more likely to contribute towards future planning processes, makes them more likely to get involved in keeping the place safe and clean. Um, so that resilience value there uh, is that the, um, the, the people are, are more likely to be involved in making the place as nice as it can be uh, at a very local level. <clears throat> The final case study is from Vila in Denmark. Um, Vila, like this, this specifically relates to um, sea level rise. Vila is a coastal city. It's on a fjord. Um, I think sea level rise. It's predicted to rise. You know, I, it's going to rise anyway. I, can't, I don't want to misquote uh, the numbers. Um, so the city's approach is to enable people to live with the water. So what does that mean? Well, that means that we have to get people to understand what the effects of climate change are and understand how, yes, of course, there are going to be huge consequences, but let's find the benefits. So they got stakeholders together to develop this resilient neighborhood called Fjordbine. Um, the key point here is the city got um, the private sector involved as well. So to create real estate opportunities, but with conditions that they must create these social spaces that A, adapt to climate change, and B, mitigate against the sea level rise. C, are places that people can enjoy from a, um, from a social perspective and can use. Um, so I think these four examples and the project pipeline are just ways in which cities are thinking about climate change and the other resilience dividends, the other benefits that can be achieved um, with collaboration and wider thinking. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much.
Thanks very much, Alex. Um, it was uh, interesting to, to hear those concrete examples. And yes, I remember writing about the Paris Schoolyards Oasis uh, project when it was launched. Um, and it's also interesting to see that since then, Barcelona um, has also um, started out on a, a similar program, um, turning schoolyards into what it calls climate refuges. And I think I happened to cycle past one the other day and peaked in, I could see that they were um, growing, uh, growing plants and things in pots. Um, although you'll appreciate that it's a little bit hard to grow grass in schoolyards in, in Barcelona, but um, uh, I look forward to, to seeing more uh, from that program here as well. So with that, um, we're going to go back to Nieve now. Um, I won't reintroduce her as I already did and we are short of time. So um, we'll hear this time properly, I hope from Nieve about the um, Madrid platform cities. Over to you, thanks. Thank you, Megan. I hope you can hear me well now. We can. And uh, yeah, as soon as you start having again uh, the, the same issue, please let me know that I will be uh, happy to help. Maybe I can- Hopefully not. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And sorry for this. Okay, here he comes again. Say, okay. um, as Megan said, I'm presenting um, this uh, initiative by the UPM University, uh, more precisely from the Innovation Center in Technology for Human Development and the Madrid City Council. The uh, platform is called Madrid Platform Cities um, and it's running from the 2018 for two years now as a multi-stakeholder and multi-task collaboration among organizations uh, to address climate change and mitigation in, in special uh, on uh, heat island effects on the city through various uh, pilot-based prototypes through various uh, case studies. Uh, more particularly, I will address the way in which we are addressing interdisciplinarity and co-creation beyond the mere addition of disciplines. So I would like first to clarify um, the vision, uh, which has been very clearly stated by Blimel and Brower on the differences between multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. As uh, the first is occurring uh, when various experts are looking to a similar question, but only applying this respective knowledge from their own field. Interdisciplinarity instead occurs if there's a transfer of knowledge across disciplines, uh, as it is in the case of bioengineering or um, social psychology, uh, to mention only two. And uh, lastly, uh, transdisciplinarity, which is um, very rarely occurring and it's uh, more recent in the terminology, is integrating the natural, social and health sciences in particular in novel and transformative context. In, this is a case of sustainable development um, and the sustainability of the built environment, uh, which is demanding uh, this huge change to occur. This is more or less the way in which the platform, um, uh, Madrid City platform is occurring, is, uh, is presented as, as I said, as a, a hinge point uh, uh, joining the interest of a number of actors so um, this is the way we are mapping the main actors, which is in one side, the different departments of Madrid City Council. And here you can see only three, but there are many of them, which are um, normally implied in this uh, nature-based solution approaches. The university with a number of roles inside um, as the scientific support, assessment, facilitation, and uh, research. Then the citizens, uh, nature-based solution, the business uh, and the markets. Uh, also addressing to external funding opportunities and networking uh, chances um, at European level, and also the incorporation, which I think is um, one of the distinctive, distinctive um, approaches um, of this platform, the incorporation of uh, unusual actors, as it is Matadero Art Center, um, with, um, yeah, in, in detail I will describe later on. So the university is providing the connecting tissue, for provoking, assessing, and sustaining collaboration in time. Madrid City Council, as a challenge owner, is providing the pilots and generating public policies towards innovation. And other bodies, as I said, as Matadero or other uh, external collaboration, will amplify the link and communication with citizens while promoting co-creation in different ways. So besides um, the networking, um, uh, layout is presented, we also need to stick to a work plan, which in this case 
uh, is represented in a, in a circular uh, timing to guide the co-creation the co -creation process. So you can see here a number of steps that I will briefly um, uh, endorse through a number of case studies. So um, it is not necessarily a process which occurs all along. Or, I mean, we don't have to fool all, we don't have to cover the uh, full number of steps, but we can isolate them and we can express how important they are in itself. The problem will be represented by the initiative uh, on Madrid uh, Cyber Garden in Matadero, the second by USERA Pathways in one of the southern uh, districts of Madrid City, and the third, which is representing the uh, one of the last uh, stages in the process, which is the upscaling, represented by a later um, initiative on the Metropolitan Forest Competition. Um, this is the first um, um, example. Uh, I will explain how the problem of scoping is something that we normally take for granted and will deserve um, a complex but and also extended um, part of a process. And in this case, um, uh, yeah, well, this is the three, uh, sorry, this is the three steps that I'm presenting. This is the first one, sorry. So in the case of Matadero, um, as I said, the network is uh, represented very clearly by the University, Madrid City Council and Matadero Art Center, by the three of them. And uh, e e the European project is the Climate Kick uh, um, Adaptive Cities Through Nature-Based Solutions, which is a project which is running uh, for two years now, in which uh, the university is playing a very important role. As you can see, we are running the World Package 5 on collective intelligence and co-creation for nature-based solutions. And uh, we are uh, looking at ourselves um, having a, this very transversal role according to the rest of uh, world packages. And we were implementing silo-busting strategies also inside the consortium uh, at such. This is one of the pictures representing the full initiative. And this is a timeline in which you can see a number of co-creation stages. The first of all, uh, engaging student uh, workshop, workshops with uh, a number of artists, the second one for the prototyping uh, stage and the, sec and the third one for the expert assessment and for the, uh, an international exhibition which is currently running. Here are some uh, pictures on the prototypes who were that were speculating um, from the um, uh, art science point of view with a number of um, prototypes uh, to tackle with um, uh, novel narratives and also uh, attending to other perceptions, even to non-human ecologies, to this very complex phenomenon of the climate change. These are the two um, uh, sorry, workshop which has been celebrated on the last uh, two years. The first one was on adaptation strategies, the second for storyboard narratives. And this is more or less the, um, yeah, the engineering applied to these co-creation processes, which are based on Paula Nishijima's Game of Thrones, which is a complex process, but uh, that uh, is worth it to be uh, recorded and registered. And this is uh, one of the basic uh, aspects that we're covering in our deliverable in the project, which is this handbook on co-creation. Um, finally, we are networking our initiative, which is um, now endorsed as a noble institute inside the Matadero Institution, which is the um, IMNA, the uh, Institute for Mutant Narratives, um, together with a number of uh, international um, initiatives, as you can see here, as they are Creative Carbon Scotland or the Forum for Radical Imagination or the Embedded Artist Project which are going beyond the uh, scientific or technical point of view on approaching to other audiences. The second uh, case study is, um, as I said, um, represented by USERA district and the, in particular the project of itinerarios habitables, uh, which is something like uh, habitable uh, pathways. And um, this uh, initiative is being endorsed also as a pilot for the uh, European project Clever Cities. And uh, in here, um, you can see uh, that this is a very robust uh, project, which, are, which is including a number of pilots in which Madrid is only one of the follower uh, cities. And you can see on the right hand how this full process um, is covering 16 steps, which are designed in a linear way. So our proposal was to make um, uh, a transformative evaluation of the overall process, taking in account all the relevant actors 
um, uh, included on the team as they are um, uh, here you have the mapping of the actors as they are Technalia, which was the representative of the uh, clever um, partnership, uh, a number of research groups also inside the university, a number of associations representing the local citizens, and also a number of, as I said at the beginning, a, a big number of uh, departments inside the city council itself. So the full process is generating uh, a strategy which is uh, able to be implemented in further projects. And this is more or less uh, what we are making here. And this like co-creating uh, co collectively the implementation strategy in order to make it exportable. The last pilot um, is, is more concentrated on the scalability of results, but is ironically um, in a project which is recently starting, which is the open ideas competition for the metropolitan forest in Madrid. In this case, the European project that we are endorsing is this climate kick deep demonstration, which um, is um, a, a very different project in the sense that it, uh, it stands on a portfolio approach and uh, a systematic approach to different, uh, different layers uh, and actors in the city. And in this case, the, the role of a university was uh, to celebrate these technical workshops and participatory uh, webinars in order to include the voices of practitioners, but also citizens onto the guidelines of the tender, of the public tender. So we end up making this uh, very nice uh, illustrated guide that it's, uh, it has been incorporated on the competition uh, rules. And uh, uh, so we are somehow hacking the full uh, uh, participatory process with the inclusion of this guide into the uh, competition uh, guidelines, as I said. Okay, I, I hope uh, that this final graph clarifies a little bit something that was presented as circular, but is something uh, which uh, actually resembles more to a loop approach, an iterative approach, which is covering a number of uh, different stages in every single project. Thank you very much for this. And I will stop uh, sharing my presentation. Thanks so much, Nimes. That was super interesting. And I'm so glad we were able to hear you properly because it's quite a complex thing that you were explaining to us. I honestly never knew that there was such an amazing process of co-creation behind some of these projects. And I think I, I would like to know more about it. And in the short time that we have, um, yes, it's uh, there's a lot to take in, but uh, the involvement of artists and, and so many different actors um, in this, uh, the processes that you described is, is, is truly impressive. And I know that the um, Climate Kick is doing some really innovative work in this area, but uh, great to hear that Madrid is, in, is involved. And I'm sure if people would like to know more about the, the theory and so on, they can, they can be in touch with you um, about it. So thank you so much for that presentation. So um, we will move on now to our last speaker, who is Despo Toma. Um, she's an award-winning New York-based Cypress-born designer who focuses on climate change adaptation, storytelling, and engagement. And Despo is an associate at Scape Landscape Architecture and also an associate of architecture at Columbia University. Um, she leads interdisciplinary teams to develop resilient strategies and next century infrastructure um, that incorporate environmental, economic, and social benefits. So Despo today is going to talk to us about the role of experiences versus knowledge transfer in the success of resilience efforts in Southeast Asia. Despo, please go ahead. Great, thank you, Megan. I will go ahead and share my screen and get started. And let me know if this is full screen. It should be full screen now. Yeah, okay, great. Um, all right, so as you mentioned again, hi all, um, such a great panel to follow. Last one, we'll try and keep it short. Um, so as Megan mentioned, I'm an associate at SCAPE uh, and in my previous role as project manager for One Architecture and Urbanism, a Dutch urban design firm in New York, I led an interdisciplinary team of designers, engineers, economists, ecologists, and community organizers uh, during the Water as Leverage for Resilient Cities Asia initiative. And specifically, I will talk about the city of Samarang where we worked for one year. 
In today's presentation, I'd like to distill and share some of the findings of our work in Saban to show that inclusive climate adaptation can only be successful if we focus on training and expanding on each community's adaptation muscle, as we call it, and focus on building the muscle memory for long-term urban resilience. So as you, many of you know, nowhere in the world are climate-related challenges so widespread and expansive as in coastal cities in Southeast Asia, where more than 75% of the population might be affected by sea level rise, landslides, um, uh, subsidence, degradation of vital ecosystems. So on Earth Day in 2018, um, the Waters Leverage Program launched, and it was the first open call for professional professional interdis interdisciplinary teams to develop transformative resilience projects in the field of water, climate adaptation, and urban planning in three cities in South Southeast Asia. So those three cities were selected as pilot cases and uh, due to their increased vulnerability, but also their ability to adapt. So these cities included Chennai in India, Pulna in Bangladesh, and Samarang in Indonesia. This year-long initiative focused on an inclusive and collaborative and innovative process with the aim to develop pilot projects that will use water as leverage for real climate resilience. With an extensive on-the-ground engagement with our partners at Kodakita, we were able to examine and identify how previous community-led actions of successfully adapting to climate challenges or water issues we're able to build an adaptation muscle and generate the confidence in a community to overcome urban climate challenges that are facing um, ahead. This was one of the key elements of our team to develop um, uh, in order to develop projects that are manageable, scalable, and bankable. So Sebaran presents an example of the cycles of vulnerability that many coastal cities in Southeast Asia are trying to break currently. And it's important to look there to learn and to be able to translate those lessons learned. So increasingly more coastal cities are becoming economically dependent on the same extractive coastal industries that degradate their environment, they extract the groundwater and deplete um, their aquifer, exacerbating the stability, the instability of the land and the quality of their waters. So at the same time, many coastal cities are projected for drastic urban densification and economic expansion in the coming years, becoming a refuge for fleeing industries from other larger mega cities that are unsustainable and are becoming over, overpopulated, that are becoming unsustainable and overpopulated. And this has a direct impact on the most vulnerable communities. So when we're talking about leaving no one behind, we really need to focus on who is feeling the impact first. So this, sound, this cycle of groundwater extraction and aquifer depletion that leads to landslides and subsidence is further exacerbated by a second cycle, by, by this shifting, rapidly shifting economy um, of Samaran specifically, as industries flee Jakarta and are finding refuge in the cheaper real estate of Samaran, industry, population and infrastructure are growing and are demanding further investment. On top of that, our changing climate with increasing sea levels and more frequent and intense storms are calling for a unified vision for the coast of Samarang and investment in multi-benefit solutions. And these solutions will need to address the increased vulnerability along the coast. You see here on the map, the extents of the coastal risk, but also act as a paradigm for climate adaptation for the Java coast, for Indonesia and for Southeast Asia at large. Current investment in, for example, what you see here, toll roads, dams, and pumps, and levees are already underway in Samarang, increasing every, every year what we call the cost of adaptation in order to keep up the eight millimeters of sea level rise per year or the coastal inundations every year. The, the cost of adaptation is it's, uh, increasing and increasing. And by 2030, to account for the 13 to 15 centimeters per year of subsidence, land subsidence, um, uh, the, 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 the cost is just extremely happy, uh, high. And this is even not even accounting the losses in productivity and the inability to accommodate for further growth um, in the city. So there is a tipping point where the cost to adapt becomes a greater than the ability of the city to invest in, in, in resilience infrastructure. Um, if nothing happens and business continues as usual, by 2040, the cost of Samaran will have subsided by three meters, three meters. 6,000 um, hectares of urban areas, including 1,000 uh, hectares of industry, 
um, will be lost. The port and the airport and many of the of the homes um, will be no longer with us. The impacts are already felt um, very strongly in the urban and rural communities or villages or kampongs as they are called. Um, and so we argue that with instead of allowing this curve to reach a tipping point and then go downwards, we argue that with an early investment in resilience, the city can move beyond this tipping point towards a resilient and sustainable future with uh, water resilience, a protected heritage, a restored ecology, especially along the coast, an expanded economy, an advanced uh, water neutral industry along the coast, and especially with a thriving network of resilient kampongs or villages, as we call them. So the key element in achieving this vision is the kampongs and their um, already flex muscle for adaptation. And what do I mean by that? Um, we've studied over 30 existing community-led initiatives and identified that many of these address issues of water access and rivering flooding at the kampong level. As you see at this matrix, if you're able to see, but trust me when I say, if you see that many of them are focusing here in the blue columns in um, pluvial and pluvial flooding and water supply, but are, are not able to scale up, are not able to address citywide or regional issues such as coastal flooding, as you see here in brown, aquifer depletion, droughts, and landslides. This is where we see an opportunity to further train this existing adaptation muscle in order to be able to scale up and address these critical issues. We identified that um, out of the many types of rivering kampong, uh, of kampong, out of the many types of kampongs, the rivering kampongs um, have learned to live with uh, changing waters of the rivers. And this is, this is built um, upon Gonzalo's uh, research and uh, Alex mentioned that, that rivering communities are much more equipped to understand uh, how water moves and innovate in solutions around water resilience. The coastal or urban kampongs that have been used um, to a more stable and static relation with the water have not exhibited the same flexibility that the rivering kampongs have shown. Rivering kampongs are already implementing systems for flood early warning systems, evacuation routes, and community-led sub water supply systems through rainwater caption and sustainable groundwater extract extraction. So we see that this notion of the adapt adaptation muscle memory emerges, and we define it as the cities or communities database of experiences representing instances of successfully adapted to climate change associated with core resilient traits. We really engage with Kampong residents and leaders in identifying how to expand on these ideas and how to share their knowledge with Kampongs in the coastal and urban areas. So we focused both in physical and um, in physical interventions, but also in building capacity within the Kampongs and focusing on resource allocation through building capacity. Physical inter interventions included um, community-based circular systems. And you see we identified three examples, three pilot projects for the Resilient Kampong Network, where um, you see here that physical interventions included community-based circular systems for water capture, filtration, reuse, in order to avoid floods, riverine floods, and landslides. We have also developed um, what we called um, a Resilient Kampong Guide. Um, to share best practices for, uh, as you see here, some example spreads for um, water sub alternative water supply sources, um, a decentralized wastewater treatment system, reduction of stormwater flooding, and many other water issues. Um, it is our belief that starting at the community level and providing the structure for capacity building and resource allocation, the city of Semarang can scale up this effort successfully and expand into the five proposed systems that um, inc we included in the final proposal um, that start with a network of resilient components and go towards a water neutral industry that finds alternatives to extracting large amounts of groundwater along the coast and towards an integrated protective coastal zone where ecology and industry are no longer in conflict, but in harmony, um, providing a thriving coast for people and habitat. So to wrap it up, um, training and the adaptation muscle of a community is the key to successfully develop and implement inclusive urban resilience projects that are viable, manageable, and effective in the long term. Thank you. I will stop thanks so, thanks so much, uh, Despo. That was fascinating. I think what we got there was a sense that there's so much going on at the local level. Um, the Kampungs are working on these problems, but perhaps 
um, there is something needed to bring that work together and, and amplify it. Take it, it to the next level, yes, yes. Definitely. And I, I thought that was super interesting. And um, perhaps working on it from the bottom up rather than the top down, um, you know, is a, is a different model, but one which I guess is probably quite um, intensive in the sense that you have to go and you have to find out what's happening and then you have to bring people together. Um, which I think is what this session is all about. Um, so we have a little bit of time left now for questions. Um, we can take questions from the audience. Um, if you have any, please do put them into the Q&A. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to ask our panelists a, a question each. Um, and then we'll wrap up if there are no um, questions from the audience. But just picking up on um, certain aspects of your presentations. I wanted to first um, direct a, a question um, to um, our colleagues from Barcelona and Madrid, um, which, you know, is something that I always ponder about, um, which is when you're talking about leaving no one behind and designing initiatives um, to help vulnerable communities. Um, how do you best go about consulting with people? Um, and what are the main barriers that you've, you've experienced um, in your own work? Um, Nieves, perhaps we'll start with you um, as you've you know, worked with some interesting groups like artists, uh, et cetera. What, would you, what difficulties did you have in kind of collaborating with these groups that you might not normally think would work on, on these issues? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Megan. Um, well, I think it really depends on the scope of the audience you're reaching. Um, as in the three uh, case studies that I've presented, they are very different communities. In the case of the Cyber Garden, they were a tailored uh, community of action, uh, which was uh, initially, I mean, the, the full process was fully um, uh, organized or engineered by this uh, Game of Swarms theory. So everyone had a role and this group of students are normally trained to work in big groups. There were more than 100 students collaborating with five artists. So it was a big community, but we were not reaching like a general audience in the um, more conventional uh, sense of the word. In the case of Usera, opposingly, we had um, a very experienced and um, expert group of um, people communicating with citizens, which is the case of Gia 21, Gia 21. These were in charge of celebrating co-creation workshops to uh, incorporate this audience that would normally occur, won't occur spontaneously. Uh, so there was also this kind of background work to, to vehiculize these uh, voices of the citizens, in particular local citizens. Um, uh, on, the, on the topic. And in the third uh, pilot, in the case of the competition for the Metropolitan Forest, which is a huge uh, and very ambitious planning for the city, there was a full choreography of how to gather the audience, but in a very uh, provocative way, because we wanted to create the guidelines of the competition while doing that. And it was more like, uh, in this case, I would say it was much risky because it was an open call. So we didn't uh, know how much people was attending and what were the specific roles. But uh, yeah, so for, for me, the uh, outcomes are always surpassing the possible uh, barriers. I think it's very important to also match it on a timeline. I hope I answer your... Absolutely, no, and it's good to hear that the results uh, exceed your, your expectations from such consultations. Anthony, I'd like to um, ask a similar question to you because I, in Barcelona, um, before the, um, with the elaboration of the, the action plan in response to the climate emergency declaration of the city, um, there, were, there were a whole, um, there was a whole process of round tables and, and consultation. Um, I, I went to one of them um, and it was interesting to see so many people in the room and I was just wondering how you managed to reach out and make sure that those processes um, include you know, people beyond organizations and companies working on these issues to, to incorporate ordinary citizens as well. Yeah, Megan, this is one of the biggest challenges of the, um, of the climate action in here in Barcelona. So many times we found that the people that we, uh, 
we we want to protect or we want to help they it's difficult to reach them and sometimes we have a language problems or even uh, socioeconomic issues that affect the, the collaboration of these communities it's uh, difficult to reach because they they don't know the channels and well this is one issue that we're addressing quite well from from here we have to develop a methodology with which we call the resilient boards and <clears throat> We use the snowball sampling about, and uh, we started involving um, stakeholders from the uh, civil society, researchers, uh, institutions, and we 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 encourage the, the first stakeholders we identify to increase and identify others that might must be involved. And we realized that many times the ones that uh, we are trying to, to address our policies are not involved. And this, is, um, this uh, can jeopardize the, the success of these, these policies. And we try to work even with, uh, with, uh, with translators and and other com well um, and organizations from from French communities. You know, in Barcelona we have a, a large uh, Pakistani uh, community, for example. And sometimes the cultural and language is a, a hard barrier, and and we need sometimes they they even don't understand what are we trying to do. So it's uh, hard work and. And well, we try we trying to address it uh, with the uh, social social actors, and and luckily Barcelona has a long tradition of uh, collaboration and and co-production of, of of different projects and and processes, and and well, we we try to do our best and and help everyone. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear, Anthony. Um, and I guess that's a, a work um, in process. Um, and uh, yeah, as the initiatives develop under the climate plan, um, I'm sure that we'll see the results of the wider consultations as well. Because as you say, there can be a language problem, I think sometimes as well. Um, the, the, the consultation I went to is mainly in Catalan, and that, that obviously um, we're in Barcelona, so that's uh, totally normal, but uh, <laughs> I, I can understand some, some Catalan, but uh, it's difficult to, to, to reach all different groups of people in a big city, which is very metropolitan, um, as, as you say. Um, Gonzalo, um, I'm coming to you next. Um, we have a question for you from the audience, so perhaps you could also um, comment a little bit on um, the, the things that Anthony, Anthony was discussing just there about reaching um, out to communities um, and whether you had any issues with that in, in Dominican Republic. The specific question that we have um, is uh, from Joan Herreau and it is how does the revegetation of private yards help to deal with flooding? So um, if you could address those two things, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. So um, in relation to the first one, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, this, this study was conducted and to help this river basin organization that is uh, trying to be established in, in, in the Dominican Republic, because currently in, in that country, there's no um, there's not a very uh, strong um, environmental management, uh, let's say, institutional framework. So as I mentioned, uh, since the 60s, there have been there, there have been plans to restore this Yaque del Norte River. But so far, uh, only in one city, actually, uh, it's related to what Alex mentioned. Uh, one, one city in the Dominican Republic, this is uh, Santiago de los Caballeros. This is cl very close to Jarabacoa they took part in this uh, 100 resilient cities uh, initiative they developed this uh, yeah city plan and so on uh, but so far what I, according to my experience in Jarabacoa even though it's a smaller city uh, because of this NGO there have been let's say there's more progress in relation to the uh, involving the communities 
So I, I showed in one of my slides the this uh, um, artificial wetlands. These wetlands have been constructed together with the neighbors, and actually, they did like two pilot projects in the city. And af afterwards, uh, the communities, af after they saw that this was a really good solution, they actually reached out to 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 Plan Yake, this NGO, to offer some plots. So some people even donated the plot so that they could have this gray water uh, treatment system in their neighborhoods. I'm, I'm talking about like uh, low to middle um, socioeconomic status. I'm not talking about like wealthy people or, or, or anything. So I would say that the, the main strength in, in Jarabacoa is actually that this NGO has been doing a great job involving communities, working together with the um, neighborhood associations. Um, this is they 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 people really trust them um, and they also have good links with the institutionality the national level and uh, state level so i would say um that's the main strength of them this was not let's say our project we took part in this helping them with the assessment but the let's say all the the this success um, has to be um recognized to plan jacket not to us um, and the question okay the, the question about the, the the private plots this is as i mentioned this has not been implemented yet this is one of the suggestions that we came up with after the assessment so uh, given the fact that in the dominican republic and all over the world but in latin america usually there's these uh, rules that rivers should be protected at least 10 meters when it comes to creeks and 30 meters when it comes to large rivers. As, as I showed in my slides, this has not been respected at all. Uh, private plots are built right next to the river. Um, so uh, in this case, this is very problematic because in order to restore the, the creek, uh, you would have to either remove people from there or just leave it as it is now. So an intermediate solution that we found out was that we could build a community-based initiative so that uh, neighbors could agree to restore the um, the creek area within the plots. And if we managed to get enough people to do this, we could actually implement kind of a um, halfway uh, restoration plan without uh, dealing with the property rights and so on, which would be very problematic in, in, in Harabacoa. This is basically, let's say, the, the proposal, but this is still not implemented, and um, we will see how it works uh, from now. Yep. Thanks so much, um, Gonzalo. That's a real um, peek into some of the kind of nitty gritty <laughs> of the initiatives and some of the um, things that you have to deal with, like property rights and how that can actually be, um, yeah, a major problem when you have sort of. Ad hoc development in places where it shouldn't be, which I think in a lot of developing um, country cities is actually the case in slum areas or, or just where people are, you know, just need some lands to, to, to build on. And then how does the city and, and how do other organisations work alongside that reality? Um, Despo, just, so just to, to follow on from that, I was interested um, if you could tell us a little bit more about um, how you've worked on amplifying um, some of the initiatives and things that have been done at the Kampung level because Gonzalo said that it was really important to have an NGO um, that was trusted and was able to work um, with communities rather than um, you know perhaps experts coming in from the outside and that, what was your own role and, and how have you sort of threaded together um, the network of knowledge that, that's been needed to um, to create, you know, the sort of master plan that you showed us on screen? That's a, that's a great question. So specifically for the city of Samarang, there are already in place some mechanisms for the kampongs, the way that structure and the leaders of the kampong are able to communicate with um, the next level of administrative government. There is already there and, and structure that acknowledges uh, a lot of local based organizations. So that was a first very crucial foundation for us to be able to reach out to them and go 
there and talk to them, understand what their work is, understand to what level the, the planning department, for example, is aware of what they're doing, how are they supporting them, um, and what else um, is needed. And basically what we really try to dive into is identify where the gap is in scaling up. So we, what is very promising in the case of Samarang is what is called the participatory budget. So the Kampong can come together and identify where the budget of the Kampong is being allocated. So what we try to do is bring those voices up to the administrative levels because this was a sort of an international competition where local department that we were doing this very in very close collaboration with the local government so that was at the city level not the regional level so that was very positive so we tried to explain why the participatory budget has already enabled those actions but where is the gap and the gap is that there is not enough funding to scale up so what we are proposing through the program is for city funds to match the participatory budget um, outcomes in a way, um, if the projects that where the budget is allocated are moving towards a more resilient outcome, then the city can sort of match the funds and double them in order to be able to scale up. And the last thing we did is that we tried to bring together um, leaders or um, key stakeholders from each kampong uh, from different areas. So I talked briefly about the different types of kampongs. One of the biggest Let's say divide is the upland and the lowland kampongs that are facing two completely different sets of challenges and um, getting them together to understand how actions of the upland kampong are directly affecting the coastal kampongs was a was a key uh, uh, point um, in the process but it, it we we understand that the, we're a very small drop in the long lives of and in, in the evolution of the Kampong. So we really try to sort of step back and allow the community leaders to take on that role. We were there to offer guidance, but we wanted to build capacity within to be able for them to step up and do that um, in the years coming. Thank you. That um, does indeed help to sort of explain how, how things have come together. And also you made the key point about the budgeting, the participatory budgeting, and then that being used as a, as a good basis to, to bring in more sort of matching funding and obviously getting the money in place um, for some of these projects is a key issue, which I know Alex, um, Resilient Cities um, Network, formerly 100RC, um, has worked on a lot in the past as well. Um, so I just wanted to finish um, by asking a couple of questions to Alex. We're going to steal an extra five to 10 minutes of people's time because we had a few technical issues and uh, we don't want to, to let that take away from the discussion. So we're just gonna run over a little bit. So Alex, yeah, I mean, you also um, you know, work closely with businesses at Resilient Cities Network and try to bring in those private sector partners. Um, could you comment a little bit on how you do that and how interested businesses are to work um, you know, with residents of cities? And then also a little bit on the funding situation for some of the um, projects that you have in your pipeline. And there was one question from the audience too, which is, the case studies that you mentioned, um, uh, are there, do they share factors um, that make them successful or is each one very dependent on its context? Sorry, there's a lot there for you to Yeah, uh, <laughs> can I work backwards through them? Um, yeah. So the first one from the audience, yeah, there are definitely factors. I would say the key factor for any project that wants to be resilient and wants to try and, you know, add resilience value or however you want to try and what, semantics you want to use to define that uh, is collaboration between stakeholders and especially end users um, without the right uh, and I think it relates to a couple of the presentations we've seen today especially from Despo where she mentioned that trying to get the right people and the right information together at the beginning of the project before it's you know too late and before the project's taken a certain path is fundamental so for me there are plenty of similarities between them but the one that always stands out for me is collaboration and stakeholder engagement and listening to people um, after that we had a question about funding for projects in the pipeline um, so the pipeline is only about six months old we have started to essentially one of our methodologies is going to be to create packages so maybe somewhere between 
three to 10 projects that either have thematic similarities and or regional similarities, and then working with people with money. So development banks, sometimes the private sector, uh, multilaterals, whoever it might be, uh, to try and get those to a position where either we can get a feasibility study done or we can implement a pilot project, whatever it might be. Um, so yes, we're making progress in that respect. We've submitted one or two proposals already, uh, waiting to hear back from them. I think, I think we actually, uh, the project pipeline, the first iteration of our report and our database analysis was released on March the 12th. And then COVID happened and then everything went a little bit turbo and everything changed. So there's been a bit of a roadblocker there, um, but it's starting to unblock itself now. And then the final question, forgive me, was the first question you asked. Um, that was about how you bring together um, the businesses that oh, yeah. I know that Resilient Cities Network is involved, uh, um, you know, with, with some of the end users, which is not always an obvious. Sure, thing. sure. No, absolutely. Um, I'll talk about what 100RC did, because actually part of my role at 100RC was managing what we called engagements between the cities and the private sector. Um, so I think a key... Again, it's, it's fairly, in my, I think it's common sense really, it's getting stakeholders and end users round the table together to talk because often if, if you know, the private sector who may be the ones, if they're consultants or if they're technical specialists or, or if they're selling a certain product, if they're not uh, directly speaking to the people who are going to be using it, then quite often you find that maybe they're here and the end users, the user here, and what you want is to get them somewhere in the middle and those ideas married together. So for me, the key is, again, the stakeholder collaboration and communication, whether that's between private sector or the municipal staff or the end user, it doesn't matter all that much. Um, but the key ways we've done that is through, uh, a key one was, was workshops. We have a lot of tools, uh, which I think you mentioned as well about the toolkit. Now, sometimes they're you know digital based, but often they are essentially stakeholder engagement tools and how to get in, we're not trying to drill down and extract information from people. We're just trying to get people to share the right information so that they can, whoever the decision makers are, can make informed decisions. Because, you know, not everybody holds all the cards and you need to try and get those cards all down on, on one table so that everybody can see it. And therefore you have a full picture and you're much more likely to have, you know, create much more resilient and, and long-term outcomes. Excellent. Thanks for answering all those uh, questions, Alex. I think um, we're coming to the end of the session now. Um, it's been really rich. Um, we've covered lots of different places geographically um, and in terms of the types of projects being discussed. Um, and I think um, one of the things that has stuck with me is this need to think about how you do the co-creation um, from the beginning of the process and trying to weave it throughout and make it an iterative process. And it seems to me that, you know, different approaches are being tried in different places. Um, and, you know, not everything will work equally, um, but that there are lots of um, ways in which um, the experience can be shared and that this is very much still a work in progress, I would say. And then, you know, I think also it's too early probably to talk about the impact of the of the pandemic, which is something that I raised at the beginning. But I think it's kind of it, it, it's in the background, isn't it? And we don't know how uh, some of the projects and some of the programs will be affected. And so obviously that's something that's going to have to have a certain level of flexibility, I guess, and, um, and, and, you know, is going to add extra uncertainties on top of some of the climate uncertainties that we're dealing with as well. Um, but one thing that I've heard quite a lot being talked about in, in some of the um, other events and conferences that I've, I've attended is that actually some of the processes um, and uh, and groups that have been put in place to deal with climate change are also helping with COVID response at grassroots level in particular. So, um, you know, it seems to, to cut both ways. And that when you're dealing in cities um, with urban resilience, one doesn't look just at one problem in isolation, but that you can use 
um, resilience as a broad um, church, if you like, to look at all the different risks that are coming down the line, even though pandemics were maybe not at the top of the <laughs> agenda, even this time last year, um, we've, we've had to adapt and, um, and use everything in the toolbox uh, to deal with that. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that will also be the case for, for climate change. So um, good luck, everybody, with your work. Um, and um, yeah, we have uh, 10 years to, uh, to hit the sustainable development goals, and it's going to be tough. Um, uh, but I think the pandemic has shown that we really do need to make um, extra effort not to leave people behind in this process. Um, so uh, your work uh, will be vital in that. Thank you very much to everybody, and we shall uh, leave it there. I would like to say um, a big uh, thank you to our presenters and, um, and to the organizers of this event. Goodbye. Thank you, Megan. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye.